Today I am really excited to have Nicholas Matthew from the music department come uh, and talk about Vienna in the 19th century, which is a place we haven't been in this course yet, and we haven't had a chance to spend much time on music either, and I think it's going to help us a lot in thinking about cities. Uh, as always, I'm going to start by giving us a couple of words, uh, word of the day, today there are two to think about and just keep in the background as we listen to uh, Nicholas talk about cities and sound. The words that I'd like us to think about today are spectator and audience. And this gets back to a theme that keeps coming back over the semester about how we engage and encounter cities through our vision as opposed to our other senses, and in particular, uh, through sound. So spectator, uh, of course, is linked to the visual, and audience refers to our auditory uh, experience of the city. But there's another sense in which the spectator implies a kind of passiveness um, that is not implied by our current meaning of audience, which implies a kind of uh, attentiveness. Now, of course, the notion that an audience would sit quietly and listen to a performance is fairly new in the old days, whether it was opera or kabuki or many kinds of musical performance, it would be natural to get up and walk around and eat and, and chat and make noise. But in our current sense of audience, it's often uh, presented in contrast to the notion of the spectator, for example, at a sporting event, uh, who is mindless, passive, and visually oriented. So I'm going to just read a little bit from uh, Guy Debord uh, from the Society of the Spectacle uh, that he wrote in 1967 on the eve of the events of Paris in 1968. And this is the first thing that I'm going to read at any length since the last time I read from Kevin Lynch uh, in The Image of the City. And I think it's interesting to think about these two pieces of text next to each other, uh, even though the concerns of Debord and Lynch were very different. <coughs> Lynch was, of course, concerned with urban form. He wasn't focused so much on uh, economics and issues of power. And he kind of took uh, vision uh, as the default means of interpreting the legibility of a city. So he wasn't critiquing vision, he was kind of taking it for granted. And by contrast, uh, Debord is, is critical of vision itself as a problem. So I'll start uh, with what he says about spectacle. And by spectacle, he means uh, mass media and beyond, uh, the products of the capitalist uh, media machine of which we are all consumers. He says, the spectacle is not a collection of images. It is a social relation between people that is mediated by images. The spectacle and all of its particular manifestations, news, propaganda, advertising, entertainment, represents the dominant model of life. It is the omnipresent affirmation of the choices that have been made in the sphere of production and in the sphere of consumption implied by that production. So he's saying the choices have already been made for us as spectators. We are kind of passive receptacles. We're kind of victims of this machine. Spectacle, he says, naturally elevates the sense of sight to the special preeminence once occupied by touch. The most abstract and easily deceived sense is the most readily adaptable to the generalized abstraction of present-day society. The spectacle inherits the weakness of the Western philosophical project, which attempted to understand activity by means of categories of vision. So what I'd like to ask as we spend time today listening um, to, to Nicholas talking about music and sound is to ask, and of course the, there's musical spectacle, which is what he's going to be talking about. So spectacle is not purely visual. But if we focus more on how we and how society listen and absorb cities through music and sound. If we're more, more focused on the auditory than the visual, how, how different, what different conclusions can we reach about spectatorship versus audiences? Um, just something to think about. I also just want to pull the thread of the text in um, because Nicholas is going to be talking about the representation of music on paper which is another theme that we've been wrestling with in terms of maps, reducing things to two dimensions. Harsha Ram helped us to consider um, how to use uh, literary texts as evidence. Uh, and it'll be interesting to compare uh, how Nicholas is going to uh, think about musical texts as evidence. So 
Um, Nicholas is a pianist, and he's associate professor in the Department of Music. Um, and his most recent book is Political Beethoven, which is terrific. I really recommend you take a look at it. Um, if you're in a hurry, you can also look at a nice review of it in last week's New Yorker, along with some other books on Beethoven. Um, so uh, I'd like to welcome Nicholas and look forward to hearing about Vienna. Yeah, it's, I should probably explain what I'm doing here at all, um, because I guess some of this material comes out of this, the, the last book I wrote on Beethoven, um, and we'll hear some Beethoven uh, in a minute. Um, but this, in this talk, I'm just going to look at some really quite marginal, kind of ephemeral things, and completely forgotten fragments of popular culture in early 19th century Vienna. I mean. As far as I know, no one writes about it except me. Um, and, and particularly from the Congress of Vienna, so that's what I'm talking about. And for those of you who don't know or sort of vaguely have a notion of what the Congress of Vienna is, it was the big meeting of all the crown heads of Europe, the sort of major one at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, where they kind of carved it all up. It actually happened a bit before Waterloo, um, but you know they were busy uh, carving it up already. Uh, before the much loved, much beloved of Metternich, you know, uh, and of um, Henry Kissinger, a century later, uh, more than a century later, um, which you know all unravelled in the First World War. Um, and so my attention to these forgotten bits of uh, ephemera um, sort of borrows in this very understated way from sound studies, and that's one of the things I've been thinking about in doing this work. Um, and it tries to sort of tackle a problem that music historians have whenever we try and absorb the lessons of kind of sound studies or attention to ambient sound or the way sound functions in urban space, which is that generally speaking, we of course our object of knowledge is organised sound, right? I mean, in artworks and precisely how we articulate in a disciplinary way or in an interesting intellectual way the connection between the kinds of not organised sounds that are the subject of much sound studies and the kind of organised sounds that we speak about is not entirely clear. This is one of the answers that I have, uh, is that we can locate this as a practice, as an experience in urban places and urban spaces. Um, and in particular, it sort of uh, gets at something that Susan was just gesturing towards, which is that um, we, we tend to divide the senses, both in how we talk about them, but also how we talk about experiences such as urban experience, whereas it's, it's pretty clear to me that even in the, and indeed, the history of studying music is deeply invested in the idea there is a purely musical or purely auditory experience. But it's pretty clear to me that, of course, all such experiences are hybrid, that everything is audiovisual, um, and it's ephemera like this kind of reminds us <coughs> of that. Um, so I'm going to start with this kind of quotation, this, this fellow describing a particular event, because it's a real micro history I'm doing here during the Congress of Vienna, and here he is talking. The immense hymn of gratitude and adoration rose to the sky, along with the smoking incense, the noise of thundering cannon, the sound of bells from all the churches, the princes surrounded by their resplendent senior advisers, the multifarious uniforms, the arms, the breastplates, the bronze of the artillery sparkling in the sunlight, the white-haired priest blessing the prostrate crowd from a high altar. This mingling of war and religion constituted a unique tableau that will never be repeated, which no painter's brush could render, a poetic and sublime scene beyond all description. Um, thus did the avid socialite Comte Albus de la Gare de Chambonin describe the high point of a public celebration staged in the Prata, which is the big garden, which has a wheel in it, you yeah, so may have been there. On the 18th of October, 1814, during the Congress of Vienna, to mark the anniversary of the Battle of Leipzig, the decisive Allied victory and by far the bloodiest engagement of the wars of France that assured Napoleon's ultimate defeat. One of the grandest tableau promise of his Congress memoir, de la Garde's description characteristically retraced the hierarchy, hierarchies on display from the excitable, highly structured perspective of the lower-tier aristocrat, the princes, their retinues, their armies, their military hardware, the churchmen, and lastly, the prostrate masses. 
each stratum adding up to the painterly, if rhetorically indescribable, scene of a resurgent and stable old order, which is one of the plainest messages intended by the celebrations of architects. And yet the description also contains a trace, this is what I'm interested in here, something not typically documented in earlier accounts of court spectacle. The quality of immersed spectatorship, a multi-sensory, though markedly sonic experience, not so amenable to the formal synoptic structure of the tableau. Song mingles with incense, cannon shots with distant church bells. To let God's Congress reminiscences serially described almost as a matter of tiresome routine, if you have to read it as much as I do, his being awestruck by the ritualized visual distribution of the elevated ranks he aspired to join. But here his text also records a charged, untidy, sonic encounter in the Viennese public space. <coughs> and this is the point. <coughs> Amid the elaborate courtly ceremonies of the Congress, the role of the spectator was changing. In many respects, the Prater Festival was a Napoleonic hybrid, blending ancient dynastic spectacle with the more modern genre of public commemoration. So this is what I'm interested in here, in the kind of transition from something that we might associate with the Monsignor regime, uh, modes of self-presentation of the state, and then something perhaps we associate with the modern urban space to do with self-representation. Indeed, the moment that prompted Daigar's rapturous description saw revolutionary-style public participation allied with carefully choreographed ritual. Having fallen to their knees during the celebration of the Mass, by the elderly Archbishop of Vienna, the crowd reportedly rose to their feet to join in spontaneously with a German hymn of peace performed by a chorus with a wind accompaniment. Don't really know what that is. It could be the angelic hymn of peace which is from the Mass. It could be something by this Hungarian lyric poet who published quite a few hymns of peace at the time, but I haven't been able to find out actually what it is. Not since the government's concerted stoking of patriotic fervour during the tumultuous spring of 1809, when Vienna was invaded by Napoleon, had Vienna hosted such scenes of mass participation and emotional, emotional display. The Austrian Chancellor Clemens von Metternich had intended the Prater commemoration to be an exclusively civic focused celebration rather than yet another martial parade. And you can imagine this period is all martial parades in urban places. It's of what defines it. But it seems that he was overruled by the Emperor, who prevailed on the aging Field Marshal Karl von Schwarzenberg to drill the Viennese garrison, which was some 16,000 men for the occasion. And so on the morning of the 18th of October, when the throng crossed the arm of the Danube that separated the Prater Gardens from the city, they did so over a newly constructed bridge whose railings on either side were made entirely from French guns captured at Leipzig, this much criticised tacky gun bridge. <laughs> The bridge led to an imposing wooden structure housing the altar, uh, which is called the Peace Tent, adorned on all sides with yet more trophies, standards, and other military plunder. I'll show you a picture of this in a minute. Once the mass was concluded, the army staged a march pass, and each soldier received a bronze medal struck from melted down cannons of the Conde d'Armée. The event wound down with less formality, seated at long tables, Arranged in a gigantic star formation, the Viennese garrison was served soup and rolls, pork, roast beef, jam, donuts, beer, and wine. I found the menu. Kaiser Franz and Zayer Alexander the descended from their seats to toast the common soldiery. And yet, even though the Austrian army had co-opted the ostensibly civilian focus of the Prater Festival, the battle that it celebrated was, especially a year on, and especially in German lands, a potent popular symbol. It's called the Völkerschlacht already then, or the Battle of the Nations, or the People's Battle. Given how many had perished there, the majority of Viennese would have had a personal connection with its horrors. Songs mourning lovers and sons lost in the Battle of Leipzig were a feature of the publishing market in 1814. A lot of my research time has been spent turning up these kind of things. It's actually the origin of a lot of, sort of modern propaganda music. A lot of it strikes the tone that we associate more familiarly with the Great War, this kind of sentimental connection of personal if the ritual practices of the Prater Festival linked established forms of court spectacle to a more dispersed and intimate kind of public experience produced in part by print circulation, the festival was also one of the earliest such events in Vienna to have been so widely recorded and celebrated in print itself. The details of an occasion whose very purpose was to manage and mediate collective memory was itself compuls 
compulsively remediated, not only in travelogues, of which Delagarde's was only one of many examples, but also in topical poetry and occasional musical compositions. So the latter included several characteristic or descriptive pieces for piano and voice, a genre that periodically dominated the Viennese publishing market during the Napoleonic era. There were tons of these. Uh, it's like a piano, but right, everyone has a piano. Um, and it's a piano piece, and it just blow by blow describes a particular event, and it has a text that you read as it goes. So it's like absolutely literally descriptive music, um, not anything that anyone would have heard recently in any sort of constant setting. And the two that I'm going to talk about here are this, um, uh, this uh, characteristic fantasy, this characteristic fantasy by a fellow called Alaba Girovet, you know, he's a was hugely famous in his time. Massive, um, sort of high fanatic, and another ton gemelde, sort of tone painting uh, by Anton Diabelli, whom we know nowadays really is the person who wrote the waltz that Beethoven wrote the Diabelli variations on. He was a huge mover and a shaker in the Viennese publishing market, um, and uh, this accompanied an occasional poem by a very prominent critic, poet, writer, historian called Friedrich August Kanner. And the, the, the um, shared principle of these pieces was the calculated combination of musical gesture and poetic declamation. So this sort of makes it a kind of what we would call melodrama, um, which is, I guess, a mode or a genre in 19th century music, which involves a bit like a movie, people speaking with music behind them, you know, to kind of heighten their, their speech. In their fragmented blow-by-blow -blow musical descriptions, they borrowed from the aesthetic of contemporary battle pieces, very common genre, pieces that describe battles, uh, kind of musical reportage, um, and sort of propaganda. Um, and in their ample use of existing and well-known musical excerpts from the popular mix and match strategies of the quadlibet, so you might know what a quadlibet is, it's a piece of music that's made from those other pieces of music stitched together, incredibly common. Uh, in the Viennese theatre at this time. So I'm just going to play you a bit of probably the most famous orchestral work of the period, which is a battle piece by Beethoven from late 1813, which is called Wellington's Victory. You may only know, those of you who are into music may know this because it's notorious, right? It's, it's Beethoven being not very good, right? Um, uh, it's uh, um, also Beethoven selling out, it's also Beethoven not being a revolutionary, but celebrating it in the Bonionic uh, defeat. Um, and it's also Beethoven being immensely audiovisual. I mean, this is kind of audiovisual, bow by bow descriptive music. I play uh, all of the stuff that sounds kind of random in this is notated, by the way, um, it, with a huge barrage of percussion instruments. Um, I'll play with a fragment. <laughs> Tremendously basic and balletic. Each of the charges from the French and English side are notated very precisely. It's obviously a cavalry charge. Come to signals from the opposing side. And so on, my boy. Um, so like contemporary battle pieces, probably the most famous, a lot of people would have had a time of transcription of this. Many people heard it. It's pulled tons of times in 1813, 1814. Um, the Prato Festival composition adopted this sort of fractured language that you kind of know what I'm talking about, I hope, of sort of sonic fragments to describe a detailed spatial distribution of people and things. A sense of space famously literalised in several orchestral performances of Beethoven's Wellington's Victory in uh, Vienna's Große Verdunsaal, where actually the, the, the musicians playing the French and the British troops advanced towards each other down a huge corridor and then met in the middle to play the piece. Yeah, it's, it's, kind of, it's a very spatially located piece. Um, but the Prado Festival compositions applied this hyper-realist spatial sense to well-known quotidian public spaces, creating sonic reconstructions of things <coughs> the Viennese already knew, rather than presenting a musical reportage about these distant theatres of war. Moreover, they combined this with a kind of melodramatic interiority, rarely on show in battle pieces. We tell this kind of, this is about sound and motion and celebration. Here, the combination of imitative musical gestures, stock thematic characters, scraps of melodic quotation, rapturous poetic declamation, 
uh, not only served to distribute the symbolism of a great public event into the domestic sphere, just as poetry, song, and reportage did, but, and this is crucial, also sought to retain, via a jumbled and hybrid form, something of the acoustic and spatial experience of public spectatorship. Right? That's partly why it's supposed to sound like ambient sound. The elaborate frontispieces of these two ephemeral pieces that I'm talking about capture to some degree how they mediated uh, these sort of public and private realms. Both sought to represent a spectator's immersed viewpoint, though in combination with a synoptic perspective that reproduced in miniaturized form, I see this, maybe we should have the life down a little bit, um, the imposing visual rhetoric of the ceremony and its monumentally axial layout. I mean, you can see that there. Um, and you can see, great, this is the Diabelli Cano engraving. Um, and it's divided schematically, you can see, into this sort of individualized foreground, so with all these assorted bourgeois and cavalry down there. And a middle ground that sort of respects the grand visual language of the festival, with a sort of impressive view of the peace tent, festooned with all its standards and trophies. And then this rather dodgy gun sided bridge in front of it, you see crossing these all kind of rifles. <coughs> Um, the arresting thing here, though, and this is sort of what I'm interested in, um, is, uh, and it's clearly the main preoccupation of this picture, is the spectacle of mass spe spectatorship itself that forms the oceanic background. The Viennese public gathered together on an unprecedented scale. The picture thus documents the mass public's awareness of its own theatrical presence, while also repackaging and dispersing its presence within the more notional public spaces mapped out by print circulation. And by contrast, the Gilbert's characteristic fantasy um, is it's obviously places greater emphasis on the bucolic environment of the Prater and the sort of convivial aspects of the event. So couples mill around under the trees, servants bring out the soup, the seated members of the Viennese garrison there have already started on the booze. Um, but the engraving will also make sure to register the assembled Viennese throng with that sort of swarm of onlookers you can see down on the right hand side, extending to a vanishing point between the trees. Uh, this reminds me of a very famous point made by Raymond Williams in his book, The City in the Country, uh, sort of a classic of uh, this analysis. That in, in, you know, we're talking here, and it's just what, what I think that I can bring maybe to this discussion a little. We're talking here about how the city becomes representable right, in arts and how, how certain artistic practices make the city representable or represent the city at certain points. And um, Raymond Williams's point is that initially the presence of the city can only really be registered through inherited vocabularies of pastoral. And that's sort of what's happening here, right? What the, that really the city is, 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 is sort of exerting a distorting effect on the visual pastoral language here, and that's how we can apprehend its sort of presence. These pictures might remind us that topical musical publications like these were primarily souvenirs serving to channel intimate memories through physical commodities, and in this instance, to allow public commemoration to be reenacted on a scale commensurate with sentimental contemplation at home, and indeed, both composition recall moments of recollection themselves. So this piece announces that there's one section called the recollection of the many perils luckily survived, while um, the Canadier Belly one has a load of majestic chords, and it says that the brave soldiers are returning home with sweet memories of this holy day. So both of them sort of precariously lay a memory over memory. We've got this as a way of remembering an occasion in which its function was to remember. Right? Um, and of course, remembrance being a pretty sort of typical theme of sentimental theatre too in this period. So like many uh, contemporary melodramas on stage, both of these Prater compositions paradoxically mix an extreme interiority with a naturalistic exteriority in a language that perpetually oscillates between the privacy of intimate musical expression and music that's barely more than ambient sound. Indeed, these apparently mismatched registers frequently blend into each other. So I can't play you a piece of this unless I had a piano. Um, but some of you may be able to read music, and those who can't, I can maybe get a sense from just having a look at it. So you can see how this works, right? There's this thing that perhaps your mate is playing on the piano or your um, sister, right? Maybe this is female music, it's quite interesting as well. Sort of, there's a gender thing here about public and private, sort of kind of a uh, making female of a fundamentally sort of heroic masculine public self-assertion. 
So here it says, um, songs of triumph and warlike songs uh, echo through the streets, right? Um, so this is actually doing warlike songs, it's sort of strange to say in Holstead, trying to imitate the sort of clamorous sound of lots of songs sounding at once, right? Um, so d disorganized sound making its way into this obviously artfully composed piece of music. And then uh, it's, it's sort of just further down the page, the, th the cheering throng make its way down to the banks of the green Don, the green Don, the, the green Danube. And you can see this sort of ripply type river thing starts here, right? So it's then here in the southern bay, it's past with some kind of watery ripple music. Um, and then you get the old man feeling young again, uh, and the, the city's youth right here, sort of joyful. Uh, cries and then, uh, and then it all gets interrupted for by all these cannon shots. It says "Der Donner stunde Krachen ruft," which is kind of hard to translate. That's the the thunderous throats of the, the thunderous throats crack, call out their cracks or something. Uh, their their crashes, and you can see that this is no, you're noisy. A lot of cannons at the time would have had extra stops that we don't have on a modern a Steinway type recipe piano nowadays. Things called like bassoon stops were very common, where a piece of uh, a sort of cylinder of uh, parchment paper is lowered and just put against the strings to make this kind of awful buzzing sound. These kind of uh, uh, stops would have been used to produce these effects even more. We can see it's just crashing chords and kind of, it's all about um, a lack of continuity, actually, you can see. Right? It's not very continuous music, just as we heard in the Beethoven example. It's all that kind of interruption and banging. Um, and you, you see, see the same thing in the Gilbert's piece. Um, and a, a lot of source music and noise in these. So here, I'm sorry, I, I um, this was part of a PowerPoint. I was trying to kind of do a punk PowerPoint. So, yeah, I find people's PowerPoints are so good nowadays. You have to protest it. As <laughs> rubbish as possible. So I was sc scribbling all over. It actually took longer to make them. It's just a regular bad one. But um, here, this is uh, interesting. Um, this is a topical effect, it says here, a, a rural liar man, a hurdy-gurdy man, like the one who shows up at the end of Mitzvah Rosa, right? Um, mixes with the joyous rose of, of people, and we get this fragment of, of hurdy-gurdy music with a kind of drone underneath, it's what you call a musette or something, it's kind of a droning pastoral music. Again, an illustration of Raymond Williams's point about the pastoral actually being the only topical language that's available for this music to describe a kind of urban uh, sprawl, a kind of urban menace. Um, and we also get, I mean, it's even more charged, uh, a surprise quotation from Haydn's song, uh, Gott der Hase Franz den Kaiser. Um, Haydn wrote the song in 1797 on the, it was a commission from the Austrian government, effectively, and it's now the tune of the German national anthem. <laughs> In the original words, um, and uh, you can see da di di da di da 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 um, it turns Haydn's song House of Loyalty into a kind of metonym for the Kaiser's person. Um, it recalls performances of Gotthalter, which follow the Kaiser around. I mean, this was being performed all the time in public spaces in the end of this period. Um, and it permitted Haydn's song to be revisited in the domestic spaces in which this fantasy was to be consumed. So it sort of summarizes, I argue, a sort of rather sophisticated actually dynamic of social relations this perpetual back and forth between kind of interior and exterior worlds. And even these tremolos, you know, this is absolutely the meat and potatoes of kind of melodramatic musical language, tremolos, right? Ooh, kind of for its general purpose, excitement. Um, it sort of actually articulate a quite complex relationship between public and private forms of expression because it's a fairly commonplace image for musical splendor. You know, you hear it all the time in pieces contemporary with this, like Haydn's creation. Um, it's an imitation of the crowd's cries of joy, and it's also an imitation of tremulous feelings of rapture itself, where right? it's about the internal tremors of the nerves, isn't it? Um, so something as basic as that, actually, 
uh, can simultaneously depict the sublime scene and its order reception, right? This internal trends of delight, shouts of jubilation. So you can see here what's happening, right? There's a fairly easy argument to be made, a bit too easy, I'm going to suggest in a moment, about what the function of these bits of popular culture um, was or is. Because since the government promoted our points of popular patriotism, which is more or less defined the end of the Napoleonic Wars in many other senses, but particularly Vienna, which was very late to embrace a kind of popular politics, and what it did is very much top down foundation of newspapers and pamphlet wars and certain habits of um, uh, public commemoration associated with the finally the founded, founding of the foundation of the conscription army in 1908 which was the, probably the last thing that really created a kind of cohesive really civic identity um, but we can see that since then many of the residents of Vienna right, obviously have to learn how to behave as a cohesive public via these sort of carefully regulated series of institutions and rituals, this conscription army, the press, the theatre, the public festival, and supplementing public official ritual with something more like personal experience, these prior festival compositions <laughs> sorry, seem to extend the reach of the state onto the music desk, into the home. The mix of charged declamation and music providing a handy analogue for the sound of modern feelings, public space, new textures, and modes of organisation miniaturised, obviously, and explained. And from this point of view, the Prato Festival compositions harness the convulsively emotional world of sentimental theatre, of melodrama, on behalf of the state. <coughs> and, uh, you know, one could say rather speculatively, if the, many have argued that the aesthetic of melodrama reproduces this kind of structure of conversion hysteria, effectively, where, whereby excessive emotion is displaced into kind of... Um, elaborate mise-en-scene or kind of uh, bodily convulsion, right? Um, so the, if, if, if indeed this is a kind of uh, his, hysterical sort of genre, then these pieces are, are, are the kind of ideological talking cure, you know. Um, the trauma of Leipzig and its recrudescent memory prompt the usual kinds of musical melodramatic excess, which is then sort of redirected into the ostensibly healthy channels of dynastic loyalty, the worship of monarchy, and well-managed varieties of corporate feeling. The theatricality of melodrama, its tremolos, its variety, its repeated expressions of awe, right, might be regarded in this case as symptomatic of a new form of public political participation which had to be entrained, right, which had to be entrained and performed. <clears throat> but I'm going to say that that reading is pretty provisional, and actually this, that's pretty standard issue for Foucaultism that I've just done there. Um, because apart from anything else, you know, it seems as though a sort of Foucaultian take on uh, power and hegemony and culture power aren't really equal to describing how um, power operates within the civic scene, particularly how power operates through art in the civic scene, I'm going to suggest. Because for one, the relationships between formal projections of state power by a civic ritual and the dynamics of an individualised urban experience are much less tractable than the story I just told implies. In fact, this sort of organisational jumble here of convention emphasises this complexity in a way that the avalanche of contemporary political songs, which also, after all, extended state ideologies into the domestic sphere, couldn't. These pieces didn't just transcribe politics into the home, being sort of intermediaries for some kind of ideology, and neither were they merely, you know, personal souvenirs, parasitic on this grandiose memory forming of Napoleon and state ritual. Rather, these prior to festival compositions with the help of an extend, expanding Viennese print market, responded to, and this is where we get to the kind of nub of the issue, they responded to and generated a new experience, a new musical experience of urban public space, and one that inevitably stood in an oblique relation to traditional projections of state power, which had actually acquired this visible audience. Uh, there are lots of places where we could go to theorise this right, development, one place I reach for, just because it's an open goal, is obviously Michel de Certeau's account of walking in the city, um, and his distinction between the lived experience of quotidian, improvisatory urban pedestrianism and these totalizing impulses and the sort of near panoptic almost views of urban planning, this, this sort of top down uh, schematic view, this spatial language of control that, a, that the metaphorical speech act. The musical act of walking habitually eludes and undoes. 
Um, and it's, it might seem weird, really, that sort of such a post-68 theory of urban experience should be relevant, but in a sense, what, what we're examining in this historical moment is the emergence of uh, modern civic identity based around a kind of participatory pedestrian, which really is not representable in any Viennese music before this time. It's just not even a way in which urban space is conceived of. So actually, uh, Certo's distinction between the pedestrian and the sort of top-down urban planning view is here sort of uh, linearised chronologically almost. It's made into a sort of historical moment. Certo proposes that the primary rhetorical tropes of urban, urban pedestrianism are synecdoche, right, part standing for whole, and asyndeton, the omission of usual synaptic, syntactical connections between parts. And given that these pieces uh, depict urban space from a broadly pedestrian perspective, it should come as no surprise that these are by far the most noticeable rhetorical strategies at work in them. Both pieces deploy the collage techniques of melodrama to reassemble the urban landscape as a string of musical topoi or path rotations, frequently juxtaposed without any syntactical functional links, and each one symbolising a totality that is never fully presented or grasped. In the Prato Festival composition, the prevalence of these rhetorical habits arguably changes how the traditional languages of state ceremony can be communicated and understood. So in uh, the Diabelli Canopy, for example, the rituals of the festival itself are uh, sort of prefaced by this enormously long process of pedestrian congregating. Um, so before you actually get to any representation of the festival, you get this patchwork of pedestrian congregation. And then only one section really stands for the official part of the uh, ceremony, uh, which is this pious andante religioso here. It's a sort of synecdoche for this, this, for the whole liturgical portion of the ceremony. It says, uh, suppress your cries of joy, keep the cannon's mouths silent, for they kneel down before the altar in humility to give thanks to the pious. This is playing this sort of rather stern chorale melody at home to remind yourself of what that feels like. And you might expect that this would provide us with what that German hymn of peace was. This German hymn of peace was that I couldn't figure out what it was. But actually it's not. It's just a completely made up substitute for whatever, um, whatever happened at this time. There's something about the individualised, sort of urban, pedestrianised perspective of these pieces that doesn't really allow for these moments of collective expression to bind together these successive fragments as they unfold. The city here is... I would suggest it's a sort of an open-ended lexicon of musical topoi, musical characters, musical styles. Um, coming to an end here. So the metaphor of theatre was actually one of the most common ways of describing um, the opulent public displays of the Congress of Vienna, and indeed all the opulent public displays of the end of the Wars. And it's one that Delegado evidently had in mind when he described this Prato festival. Um, the situation in Europe had changed comme une décoration du théâtre, said uh, the plenipotentiary Dominique Prat in his Congress memoirs. He says, Vienne va devenir le noble théâtre du patriotisme. So it's all about the, the city as a theatre hosting uh, its actors who are the, the um, crown heads, but also the, the civic population. Right? And in a sense, this realises Rousseau's very well known <coughs> fantasy of a kind of theatre in which the spectators are also the participants, right? And that's kind of, it reconfigures the city as a kind of participatory street theatre. And yet also both Prato Festival compositions drew attention to the theatricality of the event they describe, as well as the absorptive forms of spectatorship that it promoted. The more fractured organisation of these pieces and the immersive experience of urban space that this mode of organisation sought to replicate attenuated the centralised structure and unidirectional address of the lives of commemorations carefully choreographed political theatre. The business of displaying authority and legitimacy by a court spectacle was hardly new after all. Indeed, it was among the primary ceremonial modes of the Ancien Regime. The Prato Festival compositions thus imply that by the end of the Napoleonic Wars, this mode was being transformed by, this is kind of me winding up the crucial point here, was being transformed by and dispersed among a new set of actors, an active group of pedestrian spectators, no longer only standing awestruck, um, but also involved in producing a more personalised kind of theatrical access. Modern Viennese public space, conceived on this model, was becoming less the grand stage of dynastic politics and more the melodramatic hubbub of street 
level experience. So this is the distinctively <coughs> modern urban centre, in other words, and this is what I think music, particularly these bits of musical ephemera, can teach us about how that sensibility emerged and how people educated themselves to be these uh, sort of civic actors. If the Battle of Leipzig and its Viennese anniversary witnessed the charged encounter of dynastic and popular politics, something that Delegale's description seems to register with its multi-sensory dissolution of the prize's well-ordered and spectacular tableau, then the techniques of the descriptive musical composition, as well as the roots by which this genre circulated, occasioned a still more radical dispersal. While the Prater Festival was an early instance of modern official memory, mediated primarily by formal and centralising genres uh, of commemoration, like the monument, the compositions that subsequently dispersed its message leave a trace of the dynamic and more widely distributed process through which our modern collective memory was produced and maintained. The compositions by Gievovetsa and uh, Diabellicano that we looked at, I'm suggesting not only descriptive of the Vienna cityscape, they were also to some extent continuous with it. The descriptive piece like this is effectively a kind of borderless genre. Music blended into the city itself and remade the city through music. Let's stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Nicholas. That was great. I have a question, but time is short, so if anybody has a burning question, jump in. Stunned. Okay. Stunned into silence. <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead. So what really struck me uh, when you were playing the Beethoven was how much it, it sounds like movie music, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it made me think of the experience we have, you know, walking around Berkeley in the city and you come into a theater which is an enclosed dark place and you enter into a battlefield, you know, which has the requisite music and noise and special effects and so on. Um, and I'm just wondering, how does, how does that compare to what the experience of somebody in Vienna in those times would have mm -hmm. had? They were going out, you know, like the equivalent point of like a, you know, hardly stripped in bluegrass or kind of what was, what was the scene or what was the experience of feeling yeah, that we, music? Yeah, we place? tend to, so we tend yeah. to, well, there are two things that I think are really important to uh, mention in this connection. One is that um, a battlefield was a very musical place uh, until fairly recently. Um, a battlefield was not just represented in music, but had music in it. Because music, and indeed a lot of musical instruments such as the metronome, are a, a sort of military technology and are ways of encouraging uh, troops to march and to uh, uh, keep in rank and so on. And actually, the battlefield would have sounded very musical indeed. So it's not a far fetched to represent it in music. Um, and second is that these pieces were taken extremely seriously. I mean, we have a tendency to go for it because, you know, it kind of sounds uh, tacky. Um, and it doesn't conform to any of our criteria, particularly for what Beethoven should sound like. Um, but, uh, I mean, people as prominent as Goethe claimed that the importance of the battle piece was that it allowed women to know what a battlefield was like. Um, so these were genuinely pieces of reportage. And that's partly why they're so descriptive, right? I mean, if, it's, if they're not interested in the actual location, they wouldn't detail, as the press did, and as engravings and commemorative objects like that that you could buy did, the precise layout of the battlefield and what happened when. And it's precisely what this music does, down to the last cavalry charge, you know. Um, so it's, it's, it's a kind of a musical reportage. Yeah, it's not so, something so that is... So the piece of music had the picture that, that you showed, mm -hmm. but did, it also had maps of battlefields? Uh, so some uh, battle pieces did indeed have battlefield diagrams in them. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, it's very common, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's commemorative, but it's also about, it's, it's, I'm trying to sort of reinforce the fact that, there's a, that this is continuous, right? It's not a place you go to see art that represents something. But actually, this art is actually kind of bleeds into the urban space and teaches you about the experience that you're currently having. That teaches you to have that experience in musical terms, <coughs> you can argue. And of course, that's not a particularly surprising point to make, because a lot of music does that. You know, a lot of contemporary, quote unquote, urban music does that now. It teaches you how to think about and feel about being in the city. And would, would audiences at the time have had particular associations with both the motifs and particular instruments? I mean, would people have heard cymbals or kinds of horns and have thought, oh, there's something a little bit Turkish about that? Or Absolutely so. Or something a little bit yeah. Norman about that? Absolutely so. And in fact, you know, we're, we're reluctant, partly in sort of post-romantic modernist discourse about how music's supposed to work. In other words, be terribly abstract and sublime. 
that we forget that even late into the 19th century, people were encountering these practices with a fairly, what would strike us as rigid lexicon of what certain musical <coughs> gestures signified and meant. And it was precisely that lexicon that these pieces were able to draw on to be, be so descriptive. So the example of the musette, right, rhythm mm -hmm. that the Royal Holy Gurdy Man has, or certain very standard ways, particularly with triplets and stuff that you would represent cavalry and horseback riding and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, hymn singing, right, a hymn-like uh, gesture, the, the patriotic song, you know, so the age of the national song, the national anthem. So all of those things absolutely readily identifiable, yeah, definitely, mm -hmm. according to the point of, and, if, and it, you know, we sort of laugh as though that's foolish, and then, you know, as Susan just mentioned, I mean, movies, it works exactly like that. And if you look at early guides about how to play the piano during um, movies, they will more or less give you a rundown of what you're supposed to play at every single, um, every single time. So, yeah, it's a particular model of music we've forgotten how to understand that. I think we had another question over here. I was going to ask if you thought that this was a deliberate spectacle in the music, was a deliberate attempt to draw the general population into the, the triumph, if you like, of the poem. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, that's the, that's the kind of standard issue, ideological thing that I kind of sort of floated and then sort of slightly cast doubt on. I mean, it, it's pretty obvious that the, the items of early popular culture like this, I mean, you know, would be legitimate to all of that. Um, uh, a dispersing the messages of the state into the home, and that's what they're for. And if that's why they exist at all, I mean, just during the 20 years before this was, uh, these pieces were published, the Austrian state had concertedly founded newspapers and allowed more publishing houses to exist, and had slightly lifted uh, their tight control over this stuff, purely in order to try and generate a sense of civic identity. Uh, the question is whether that doesn't also do something to the rather to the centuries-old top-down forms of power that, that were still resonant in Vienna. Something actually distinctively modern. But one, it distances them, and it turns them into an object of kind of immersed spectatorship in a way that the Habsburg monarchy had never really been. You know, and that's all trouble. It's sort of interesting at the moment. Well, thank you, Nicholas, and thanks especially for bringing questions of power uh, into our discussions, which I think we need to always keep in mind, and um, I hope we'll, we'll keep in mind moving forward through the rest of the semester. So thank you. Thank you.